right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Saab Brown, principal of Eastern High School, the pride of Capitol Hill, and I want to welcome you and thank you all for being here this morning. Mayor Bowser, Chancellor Ferriby, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us as DCPS launches the guide. At Eastern, we, we call ourselves and our mantra is the pride of Capitol Hill because we have a lot to be proud of. We are best known for our growing international baccalaureate program, which prepares students for the rigors of college. We have an amazing choir, a supportive staff, and we also have the strongest marching band in the city, the blue and white marching machine. But if there's one thing that I'm most proud of, it is our students. And I have the privilege this morning to introduce and bring up one of our 10th graders, Jermisha Hinton. Jermisha, <laughs> Jermisha is a 10th grader who is coming to us from Jefferson Academy. She currently works after school at Higher Achievement and is part of Dr. Farabee's student cabinet. She helps in an amazing way throughout the building and has a lot more to give and is so and we're so proud that she's here to speak to you about the guide and introduce our mayor. So give one more round of applause to Jamisha. Good morning, everyone. As Mr. Brown said, I'm a student at Eastern. I'm in the 10th grade, which means that I've had like firsthand access to this guide. And the first thing I want to say about it is the very first page, the guide shows you your transcript. So you know where you stand academically. You know what a college would see if you had to apply to college tomorrow. This guide also show, gives you some career and college options. First of all, it gives you colleges based on your PSAT score and your current GPA, colleges that you would be likely to get into as of right now. Then it goes on to give you college op career options that you have and how much what your yearly salary would be based on what level of degree you chose to pursue with these certain careers. So for example, if I decided to get a high school diploma and go into tailors, dressmakers, and custom sewings, I could make $26,000 a year. So this guy basically gives me the, a good idea of where I could be in my future based on where I am now. There's also a checklist on here that shows me all the steps that I need to be taking to ensure that I'm prepared for the future. There, there are graduation action steps, college action steps, and career action steps, all of which will definitely help me to ensure that for the future, I know what I'm doing and I'm not lost at all. For example, one of the first graduation action, action steps is to schedule a meeting with my counselor and my parents so that we all can sit and say, okay, this is where I am and this is where I wanna be and this is the work that I need to be, that I need to do to get from point A to point B. Um, that, and that's the guy. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I'm supposed to leave now. <laughs> Let's hear it for Jermisha. Thank you, my dear. And Principal Brown, thank you for welcoming us. Where did he go? There he is. Uh, to the pride of Capitol Hill. It is always wonderful to be here, to meet the students, to see the beautiful building, uh, and to hear uh, about the learning that's happening here. I also want to welcome our leader for DCPS, Dr. Lewis Farabee. Let's give Ms. Dr. Farabee a big hand uh, and thank him for being here as well. So we are really talking about um, providing our young people all the information information they need uh, and their families. So every step of the way, uh, they uh, know how to plan for what comes after high school uh, so that they are prepared for learning uh, while they're in high school and college and career uh, after and that they are planning to build a right life right here in Washington, D.C., if that's what they choose. Uh, what do they need to be doing to earn, uh, to earn a good-paying job and raise their families right here in D.C.? Uh, I also want to recognize Daniel West, who is here. Uh, and Daniel is a college and career coordinator here at Eastern High School. Uh, and we are very hopeful that this guide is going to help you in the work that you do every day with our students. 
Uh, Mr. West is a graduate of Coolidge Senior High School right here in the district. He earned a bachelor's degree from Morehouse College and his master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, So when he's talking uh, to our young people, uh, we hope that they see themselves in him uh, and what hard work uh, in a plan can do to get you to the rest of your life. Um, So not only are we proud that he's a DCPS alum, um, but now he works for DCPS. So thank you so much for being here. And I think uh, everyone knows uh, that last month I sent my fiscal 2020 budget uh, to the Council of the District of Columbia. Uh, And once again, uh, our budget, uh, and this is my fifth, uh, represents significant uh, historic investments in D.C. public schools. Uh, And with this budget, uh, we are able to increase our uniform per pupil student funding formula by 2.2%. We are able to expand access to child care and early education uh, with a $52 million investment uh, in creating new child care seats. And I want to pause on this for a second while we're in a high school you know, it starts somewhere, doesn't it? Uh, and what DCPS tells me is they, they want to get children uh, younger and younger, as young as possible. And so we are able to create these new seats with a, a model that we will get to see uh, st- started uh, in a couple of examples this year um, by having uh, our young people in the earliest of ages starting at age three. Uh, so we are able to create these new seats at Old Randall Highlands and Ward 7, the Old Minor School here in Ward 6 and uh, at Thurgood Marshall in Ward 5. We're also able to put an additional $4.6 million as a down payment on our plan to equip every student grades 3 through 12 with a laptop or device. And this has has been... Thank you. Uh, A priority for Dr. Farabee, uh, and I know that he will work with uh, Octo over the coming year to make sure we have a multi-year plan to get there so that every child in those grades uh, has a device. We're all doing, uh, also doing more to ensure our students have the supports they need to focus and succeed uh, inside and outside of the school with a $6 million investment to expand uh, access to school-based mental health supports. Uh, and this is in addition to the school nurses uh, that we provide and all the existing counseling services that exist in each one of our schools. Uh, these investments will build a, a network uh, within in and out of the school to help students succeed. I'm also proud that we're v- being very intentional and bold about how we're supporting our high school students. Uh, so next year, we will begin early college programming at Bard, uh, and we will begin early college programming at Coolidge. Uh, And we know that this is uh, very important to expand and challenge our students to do more. Um, But we know uh, upon graduation, they also leave with something valuable, credit. Uh, and credit that will be uh, able to be applied to their degree. And today I am proud to be launching, uh, as you heard from our student, uh, and with DCPS, the Student Guide to Graduation, College, and Career. Uh, We certainly know we want every student to have at their fingertips where they are, uh, where they need to be, um, but also to think about how they challenge themselves. Uh, I frequently uh, get to talk to young people when they're when they're graduating, and I start uh, in middle school um, telling the kids, and we all the adults in the room know this already, um, but the kids don't know. Starting at about twelve years old, the decisions that they make affect their choices when they become adults. And so they have to start taking very seriously what class they take, whose friend uh, they will be, uh, and how they're going to challenge themselves. Are they going to take the easy path or are they going to take the tougher path? Uh, And sometimes they just don't know the difference. And so we have to tell them every step of the way um, that we want them to think about the decisions that they make right now and the impact that it'll have on the rest of their lives. So beginning this week, 
8,400 DCPS students in the 9th, 10th, and 11th grades uh, will receive this guide, uh, and uh, which will provide an individualized look at their progress. Uh, here at Eastern, we're making good on that progress. In 2007, for example, 41% of Eastern graduates attended a two- or four-year university. Uh, last year, in 2018, 52% of graduates went on to attend a two- or four-year university. So you see that growth over one year's time. Our goal is that by equipping students and families with the student guides, those numbers will continue to increase. This is a first of its kind for DCPS uh, and positions the district uh, as a leader in, in supporting um, our students. Uh, when I tapped Dr. Faraby, uh, this was top among the issues that we discussed uh, in terms of his thoughts about how to lead DCPS and change trajectory for DCPS high school students. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Lewis Farabee, the Chancellor of Schools. Good morning. It's a great day. Uh, we're really excited about the launch of our graduation college and career guide, and it builds upon historic investments in our young people in, in D.C. public schools. So please join me in recognizing our wonderful, amazing mayor and these investments that you've allowed us to um, provide more resources for our students. Uh, we know that if we can intervene and support our youngest learners earlier uh, and follow them through a trajectory of K-12 with supports that they need to be successful in the classroom, outside the classroom, uh, we're positioning them to do well and have a quality of life uh, when they graduate from DCPS. And more importantly, a fair shot. And so I know the mayor's talked about a fair shot for every DC resident, uh, and this budget represents that fair shot. Uh, it represents supports for wraparound services through an investment in our connected schools model. Uh, it represents technology devices one-to-one -one for our students in the classroom. Uh, it represents an investment in ensuring that we're putting resources closest to our schools that have historically struggled with student achievement. Uh, we believe this launch is an enhancement to those investments. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to give power and empowerment to our high school students. Uh, as outlined today, over 8,000 students will receive these guides this week. And as I've visited all of our high schools and talked with our high school students, I've had the pleasure of having focus groups, uh, tours at our high schools, and I always embedded in the question, what are you going to do when you graduate? Uh, and it's, it's, it's fascinating how empowering it is when young people can talk about their dreams and aspiration, but they can follow it up with a plan. And they know what's required of them to pursue those dreams and aspiration. And this guide provides them with a plethora of information, but information that is customized to them. Uh, it begins with a letter that is personalized to them. Uh, and then it's followed up with their transcript. And so this will go out to ninth graders, 10th graders, and 11th graders. And so as we think about being upon the graduation season in June and knowing that our class of 2019 will be turning the tassel this year, we know that they'll be prepared for the next phase of life. But we want to ensure that all of our students, as they're approaching graduation day, have a solid plan. And so with that, we provide a guide to graduation and there are three areas that we want to ensure our students know where they are. Uh, one is course completion. So what are the courses that you've completed, you've already taken? And then what courses do you need to complete before graduation? And then there's the volunteer hours that are required. So we provide information to students where they are in completion of their volunteer work. And then their in-seat attendance. We want to ensure that they have a picture of what their attendance has been thus far and then any gaps that need to be closed as relates to attendance. And you can see examples of several of the other pages. Uh, the page that I outlined previously uh, is here as it relates to graduation, but you can also see illustrated here, we provide information about college attainment and admissions. And we provide information how students will compete with other students across the nation as it relates to their career interests. 
And then what I love most about this, it's it's not a you know college or career, but it's a both yes and. And so it also provides information to students who are interested in going directly into the workforce after graduation, uh, particularly for those students that are pursuing career and technical education pathways or earning credentials in high school. It gives them a look into the future of how they can maximize those credentials, build upon those credentials, again, to pursue a quality of life, enter the workforce, and potentially go back to college as they're working at the same time. And so we want to ensure that our students have many of options uh, and they understand what those options are, but they know what they need to do in high school to be prepared. And finally, we want this to be a tool for our families and our students to hold us accountable. Uh, and so knowing what's expected of you, we want families to utilize this information to ask us the tough questions about what courses need to be completed. What are our offerings? Ensuring that students are prepared and are receiving the necessary supports to pursue their dreams and aspirations. Uh, as we close, I also want to just recognize all of our partners that are here today. Uh, we did not get to this point alone. It's been a year in the making, and many of you in the room have given us valuable feedback and input in how we can craft this guide to be very personalized, customized, and unique and meet the needs of our young people. So again, join me in a round of applause for all of our, all of our partners. Uh, and Jamisha, I'm glad she had the opportunity to do the introduction today. She's on uh, my student advisory council, and she's reminded me, like, every time I've come to Eastern, we haven't had an opportunity to spend time together. And she said, they need to know that you know me. So I am glad uh, that we are here together, and hopefully uh, the students here will, will see us and, and know that we have a great relationship but it's, it's a reflection of the relationship that we should have with all of our young people uh, to prepare them for the promise of great success and a fair shot. And if they want to live and work in the District of Columbia, they have the opportunity to do so. And so thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will have a brief Q&A session next, and then we'll have an opportunity to walk through with families some of the elements of the graduation, career, and college guide. So I'll take press questions first and then community questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Press from uh, Dinwood Citizens Association Press and okay. friends of Dinwood Library Press. Okay. Do you have a question? Yes. Okay. First, I'd like to make a comment. I want to really thank all the people who designed this because uh, Heather is here, Vital is here, I'm here. We work with Dr. Aaron Bebo, so it's very exciting to see this. Good. My question is this. After our students graduate from high school, don't get mad at me, Queen Mother Mary. I won't get mad. Okay. <laughs> I just want to warn you. Once they graduate and they graduate from college, how can they really afford to come back here and live in Washington, D.C.? Where, where are they going to live and pay their own mortgage, pay their own whatever as young adults? Well, that is, uh, I didn't talk about our investments in affordable housing, but we have significant investments in affordable housing as we have had for the last four years. Uh, in fact, when I became mayor, we were investing about $50 million a year in our housing production trust fund tool. Uh, we were able to double that for four straight years. And this year, we increased it by more than 30%. Uh, so we went from $50 million a year to $100 million a year, and now I'm proposing $130 million a year in our housing production trust fund. Um, but what we're talking about is we have, to, we have to work on both sides of the equation. We have to work on producing more affordable housing, but also making sure that we are attracting good-paying jobs to our city and that D.C. residents are getting those good-paying jobs. And that's how our kids will be able to afford to live wherever they want to live. Thank you so much yep, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Yes, Mayor. Uh, this afternoon, uh, teachers are going to be protesting. Uh, not just teachers. I guess various groups will be unions will be protesting. Um, the the idea is that uh, I guess you have increased 
education spending, but at the same time, certain areas of the city apparently have suffered uh, declines. In, mm -hmm. in uh, for example, I think all three of the high schools east of the river are having budget cuts. Explain that to us. What do you have to, to say about that? Well, um, certainly in what we call, you call it a protest. I call it the budget period where people come out to express um, what they want to see in the budget. And that's how our, our process is set up. Uh, we do uh, engagement uh, with community groups. We do our direct engagement um, with folks. The DCPS community does direct student in school-based um, engagement also before our budget is set down. Uh, and then after that, the, the council has a period of time where they review our budget and make um, some final budget decisions. And during that period, people will come out and express um, their, their priorities, and we encourage that expression, and we listen to it, too, and we've listened to it um, throughout. But at the end of the day, we have a certain amount of money coming in. Um, I've made some decisions to increase that, that revenue, as you know, that are being criticized by some, uh, largely that the increased revenue that we're getting uh, this year that I have proposed in my budget is funding affordable housing programs, which are significantly important. Uh, our budget represents more than a $50 million increase in public education, and I've already outlined some of the new programs that, that we uh, have identified. Uh, the truth is, however, uh, that our uh, public education funds per school are largely dictated by the number of students at that school because we have a unified per pupil funding formula. And the number of students largely dictates uh, how much money a school will get. Uh, now there are some things that we also include in this budget, like do we need to revisit that funding model, not necessarily the per pupil funding model, but for example, um, the 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 model that DCPS has used for many years and how much staff each school should have is largely drives um, what a, a, the individual school, how it will decide to use its money. That's one thing that we should make sure is still working for us. How at-risk funds are distributed at the school level. That's another thing um, that we should be looking at. Uh, and then another tougher question is, uh, how do we make sure that schools have more kids, right? A school that has 1,000 kids is going to have access to more staff than a school that has 200 kids, for example. So we have to always be very thoughtful um, and intentional uh, about the policies that we make to make sure that we have schools that have enough kids to drive the very robust set of personnel and program offerings that every family deserves. High schools are losing. I mean, if, if these are schools that are suffering the most, it seems like they're on a downward path if you, if you can continue to cut the funding for these schools. Well, we have to figure out how to attract kids to those schools, um, and that's certainly true. And what we also have to know, uh, Sam, is that in addition to the per-pupil funding formula funds that they get, um, many schools east of the river will qualify for additional funds um, related to the OSSI programs and the star ratings. So they will get additional funds. And the chancellor uh, may want to say some additional things. We're also creating a new program east of the river uh, that has garnered a lot of attention uh, at Bard Early College. And so there will be an additional investment for high school seats that are attracting parents. Yeah, so um, as the mayor has outlined, one of the primary drivers for school funding is enrollment. Uh, and many of the schools that you're highlighting have realized declining enrollment over an extended period of time. And, and so when I've asked family members that same question, um, many have um, alluded to the fact that they've lost confidence in the instructional program. Uh, and there's a desire to redesign the academic offerings and the curriculum and the programs in those schools. And so the investments that go outside of the school-based budgets provide a tremendous opportunity to do so. So, for example, at Anacostia High School or Baloo High School, 
uh, outside of their school-based budget, there are over a million dollars of investments that will go to those schools to redesign their instructional programming towards areas of interest. So I highlighted earlier today, there's much interest in career and technical education and providing more career pathways in high school. And so this is an opportunity for us to provide those options in partnership with the school community. So right now, uh, as we speak, principals are having those conversations with those school communities around what those interests are and how we can embed those interests in those new options that will be offered to students at those high schools. We believe that is the most solid way, strategic way, that we can build confidence, be responsive to what the community has asked of us, and to increase enrollment in those schools where we've seen decline over time. Security, whereas before that was handled out of the central office. That's quite a task, particularly in some of the schools that are in areas that are, well, you know, less than really safe. Thank you, Sam, for asking that question and giving me an opportunity to clarify that. So in a spirit of transparency, uh, and as the mayor highlighted, there are many um, guidelines and policies, if you will, how we fund our schools that make it complicated in many ways to to be as transparent as we like. And so you should know, the community should know that we are evaluating that and we'll come back with some recommendations around how we can provide a more transparent picture into how schools are funded. Uh, but in the spirit of tra uh, transparency, we added elements to the budgeting process to give the community and families a great insight into how schools are funded. And one of the biggest expenditures was security. And so we reflected that so communities could see the costs associated with security in all of our schools. However, that expense is still managed centrally. And so that is not a takeaway to the school's budget. It is just a reflection of what that expenditure is for each school for the community to see. So it, it does not have an impact on the funding they would have received based on our allocation model as it stands right now. Terry. Yeah, I have two questions, one about this funding and the other about the report cards. Um, first, you know, off of what Sam was asking, I've been talking to a lot of Ward 8 and Ward 7 families and teachers in these Blue, Anacostia, and Woodson communities, and there is this fear that, okay, enrollment's declining, on top of that, our budget's taking a hit. Um, are we still, what does this mean for our schools? I mean, does the city still want these neighborhood schools there? My question for you is in five years from now, what do you see as Baloo and Anacostia? What, what will their role in the city be and what will they be looking like? So the, the planning that's taking place that I referenced earlier with the principals in the school communities I believe position us well to offer the most attractive programming for those high schools that are meeting the needs and the interests of students and families in those neighborhoods. So five years from now, the expectation is the majority of the families that are living in those communities with high school age students are actually choosing the high school closest to where they live. And those high schools are in fact serving those students in such a way that they're prepared for college and career, uh, and as we've talked about today, have a fair shot of success once they graduate from DCPS. Um, we have some of those elements now. Um, we have a amazing hospitality program at Baloo, for example. It's a part of our NAF Academy model where we see students across the district in our NAF Academies have higher GPAs, uh, have better attendance, and have the best outcomes as relates to post-secondary success. And so we're building on strategies like that to ensure that all of our high school students are having those types of experiences and having success in the classroom and, again, are prepared for post-secondary success. And so that's the expectations for all of those high schools. Um, as we discussed today, when, when you have years of decline enrollment uh, and you have very small high school populations, it just becomes more and more challenging to provide those offerings in that way. And so this is a big investment to bolster those offerings in the hopes of bringing those families back into the high school uh, and the level of engagement that we're having with the community to align 
those offerings with interest, uh, I believe positions us well to bring many of those families back to those high schools. So based on the work today, you do see those three schools being neighborhood schools for long times to come? Yeah, you know, I, I think we want to ensure what what we are developing is responsive to what the community is asking for us. I mean, we create some options that are, you know, very attractive. Um, you know, do we want to just limit it to those students that are in those communities? I think those are questions that we'll have to answer in the future. Uh, but we do want the students that are closest to those high schools have the ability to choose their high school that's in their neighborhood, and it's a great experience. My second question is, you know, back when this, you know, scandal or controversy broke out last year about graduation and kids not um, – you know, meeting the requirements to graduate. Some of it was not necessarily where these, not knowing where they stood, but not meeting the requirements and still being able to graduate. So my question, how does this play into kind of the checks and balances system that um, you had, the mayor had talked about, you know, kind of bolstering? If a kid has 50% attendance and that shows up on the top left-hand corner of their thing, I mean, are they automatically... That may have been the wrong metric, but are they automatically not allowed to graduate? How how does this play into that? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I see the guide for graduation, college, and a career as a tool of, of great information that's customized to to student and where they are in their planning, but it also could very much be a tool to hold us accountable uh, for ensuring the students are actually completing the courses that are required uh, and have. Uh, the scheduling opportunities to do so between their ninth and 11th grade years and going into the senior year. Uh, and so as we think about accountability, I think this is a, a tool that uh, students and parents can utilize to hold us accountable. Um, great example of that is we've already started a process of implementing uh, attendance letters to families uh, where we see challenges with uh, absenteeism. Uh, just sending that information home to families has already uh, sparked an increase in attendance as more families and more students are aware of where they stand as it relates to attendance. And so we believe that this information will spark some actions, and a part of the guide are some action steps for students, and we want the families and students to hold us accountable as it relates to those action steps and ensuring students are prepared for graduation. Yes, teachers, counselors have access to this information, uh, and we would want a student to, to come in, for example, and share their transcript and ask the hard questions around, how do I ensure I take this course? Um, and how am I being scheduled to complete these courses over time that reflect my interests and my dreams after graduation. Dr. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to our city. My question for you is, for families who have children with special needs, all children have special needs, but children with very special needs, and I'm, I'm going to pick on the pride of the city, Kelly Miller. They have an autism program. I like to see a therapeutic horseback riding program, and I've written several proposals they don't have the money for that now, but it would benefit those students because I'm not understanding how children who have autism are being compared to a school like Kennedy Krieger, a school like Ivy Mount, where we don't have those resources. So what, what is your proposal to help these children who would, would be able to graduate and would be able to work for themselves, but how, how do they fit children with special needs and adjudicated youth fit into all of this. And so, you know, our our expectations around preparation and planning for graduation and post-secondary success is consistent across all student groups. Uh, and we have had a laser light focus on our students with disabilities to ensure that... Yes, students... Yep, yeah, so with abilities... Uh, happy, ha happy, to, happy to go that route. Uh, appreciate that point of clarification. Uh, you know, I think our students with abilities, we want to ensure that they are acquiring as many skills as possible to go directly to either higher education or go to work right out of high school. Uh, and I believe this guide represents 
uh, a, a strong step forward in ensuring that students and families understand where they are and, again, can ask us the tough questions about what can we do, whether it's... People either need to have more babies or adopt more babies to fill these schools up. But what he's asking, this has been over a period of years, people have been leaving the schools because, like he said, they're not trusting what's coming out of that program. I have a daughter who graduated from HD, and she's doing very well. Tower Power always will be. So I, I just really want to hear and see some things that I'm not hearing or seeing. At the top level of people who are doing well, the children who are doing well are doing well. I'm talking about those children who are two grades behind, who are one grade behind. I want to see a one-to-one -one mentor with each of those children to bring them up to speed because I don't know how they're going to fit into this program if they're already two years behind and haven't been identified as children with very special abilities. Yeah, so, so I know that's something that yeah. you can think about that. I know we will think about that. I'm not advocating for people to have more children. I want to be clear about that. Uh, but, but I mean, you know, we'll let them decide that. We, we, we are uh, at a historic number of residents in the District of Columbia, and we believe that growth and prosperity is, is amazing. Uh, and we want to ensure that, that that access to prosperity is available to all of our students and families. And... Uh, you know, I think what we do know is there's a lot of students, school age, high school age, that are in those communities that aren't choosing their neighborhood high school, and they should be. And they shouldn't have to go outside of their neighborhood uh, to have access to high-quality options. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Where are we going next? Where are we going next?